Hey guys, my name is Robert Breedlove and I'm here today to talk about Masters and Slaves of Money. This is a essay that I wrote recently um, to depict what central banking is in a grand historical sense. Um, the entire history of humanity is, is marred by many episodes of slavery and violence, coercion of various forms, and uh, I think the the institution of central banking is best viewed through that lens. So what I, my aim was to kind of go through a brief history of some forms of money, um, discuss how they're related to episodes of slavery in the past, and then draw parallels and comparisons between those and the modern institution of central banking. So with that, I'll jump in and I'm just going to go section by section. So. To start, I'll read you the, the intro. Money is a tool for trading human time. Central banks, the modern era masters of money, wield this tool as a weapon to inflict wealth inequality and steal time. History shows us that the corruption of monetary systems leads to moral decay, social collapse, and slavery. As the temptation to manipulate money has always proven to be too strong for mankind to resist, the only antidote for this poison is an incorruptible money. Bitcoin. So the first section of this piece is titled, Counterfeiters are Slave Masters. And I open it with a quote from Frederick Douglass. It says, quote, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave, unquote. So I start out with an example of a money used in ancient Western Africa called agri beads. These are small decorative glass beads used for centuries in uh, ancient Western Africa as money. And because glass making tech was relatively primitive at the time in Africa, these beads were scarce relative to other goods and services, which gave them a monetary property that supported their value in the marketplace. And back in Europe uh, at this time, glass making technology was much more, much more sophisticated than in Africa. So around the 16th century, when Europeans started to land in Africa, uh, they quickly discovered and discerned that these beads were being used as money. And it wasn't long before they realized uh, the economic opportunity at hand. You know, we can go back in Europe, manufacture these things at scale using glass making technology that's much more sophisticated, um, much more cheaply than they can make them here in Africa. We can arrange expeditions from Europe to Africa um, shipping in these beads and use them to acquire goods and services in Africa um, at basically a, you know, an unfair price. So this dynamic um, highlights what the counterfeiting of money is because essentially these agri beads for all intents and purposes were counterfeit um, relative to African locals. Now there's an argument, argument to be made here that essentially Europeans were technologically disrupting Africans because they could produce this money much more cheaply, which is accurate. Um, but as we'll see, there's, there's definitely a moral line that's crossed at some point. Um, and in fact, this also points to why gold eventually became selected as universal money because it was the, the monetary technology most resistant to production. So no matter how much time, effort, energy was allocated towards its production, it was the monetary good whose supply would get increased the least, which is why the, the game theory of money sort of settled on gold as its, its universal substrate. So these expeditions were arranged by Europeans and they would actually pack ship holes to the rim with these glass beads and ship them in from Europe to Africa um, and then use them to basically acquire goods and services in the marketplace, in the, the local African marketplace. And what followed this seemingly innocuous, uh, you know, importation of glass beads was this multi-century um, confiscation of African wealth, right? Uh, what I argue is a slow motion criminal episode um, that, that evolved over, over centuries. And ultimately, these agri beads, this, this um, glass monetary bead, would later become known as slave beads because they were instrumental in the transatlantic slave trade. So eventually these impoverished African locals um, who were you know, essentially usurped of their, their wealth 
uh, and resources through this counterfeiting operation would ultimately start to sell themselves and others into slavery to the Europeans. So um, the, the use of agribeads and the counterfeiting of them led to their uh, designation as slave beads, which contributed directly to the transatlantic slave trade. And looking at the transatlantic slave trade, um, it's just a, a monstrous atrocity. Uh, this unfolded between the years of around uh, early 1500s to the mid 1800s. It was about a 365 year affair. There were over 12 and a half million lives stolen directly from African shores. So packed into ships in Africa and uh, left for American and European shores. Um, about 2 million of those people died in transit. And this, that does not contemplate um, their children and their progeny who were born into slavery and so on and so forth uh, in a, a multi-generational repercussion that we're still suffering from today, right? Um, clearly, you know, here in the U.S. in 2020, racial tensions have reached uh, an all-time peak. And many would argue that uh, the roots of that are actually in um, antebellum South era slavery, which has its roots in a counterfeit money system called agribeads or slave beads. So... It's really interesting to trace these roots back um, and see money's relationship with slavery. And to quantify this atrocity, um, assuming, I made the assumption that basically each slave could labor for about 5,000 hours each year um, and with a typical lifespan of about 40 years, 40 working years. And if you look, if you quantify slaves in that way, this total time theft total time stolen from these people, uh, just directly stolen again, um, the 12 and a half million lives directly stolen. Over that 365 year period, the transatlantic slave trade was responsible for stealing about 6.8 billion human working hours per year for a total of two and a half trillion hours stolen uh, over the three and a half century period of the transatlantic slave trade. And um, that, I, I use that quantification to come back to and compare um, other other counterfeit systems, uh, kind of counterfeit monetary systems later. So it started with that. It started with the agribeads, it started with the slave beads, and then, um, and you know, unfortunately, that it's not, agribeads are not an isolated episode in ancient Western Africa. Another form of money called panos was a cloth strip form of money used in ancient Africa for centuries. And the uh, story is that this form of money actually came to Africa by trading with Muslim traders north of the Sahara. So they, they, the trade routes intersected and this um, cloth strip panos money became a commonly accepted medium of exchange over time by dealing with these Muslim traders. And it was used for a long time, um, but eventually uh, the Portuguese would actually move in on this form of money and they set up um, a company called the Grau Para and Maranao Company, which was a state-sponsored monopoly on Panos production, so the production of this cloth strip money. And it required that all financial flows denominated in Panos would use their warehousing or trading post operations. So it was one of the first, the earliest um, earlier state-imposed monopolies on money, which again, the, the, the entire course of history is, um, is full of, of state monopolies on money. The state has always given into the temptation to control money, because if you can control money, uh, you can essentially control people's time, as, as we'll argue here in the piece. And um, this Portuguese imposition of a monopoly is really interesting, because they required Panos um, to be used in the denomination of slave trade contracts, to hire soldiers, uh, and to collect tax payments. And this is interesting because, you know, to, just, to name just one non-coincidental example today, the U.S. dollar is imposed on citizens to collect for tax payments as legal tender, so in the settlement of all debts. Uh, its, its use is forced for the denomination of oil contracts, um, which Matt Ridley in The Rational Optimist says that hydrocarbons are the energy slave of, of modernity. So the reason we've largely been able to 
emancipate slaves throughout history is because we've been able to rely on these alternative energy sources instead of manpower. So I thought that was pretty interesting as well. Um, and then the US dollar too is enforced as the international reserve currency, which gives the United States the ability to essentially ship the world uh, these paper slips that we call US dollars, and they in turn ship us goods and services. And that that's a trade imbalance that's benefited us um, since the end of World War II, when we actually imposed the US dollar as the international reserve currency. Um, so, again, uh, another thing about the panelist production that was a bit insidious is that the Portuguese monopolized its production, so they, they violently suppressed competition. Anyone else that was producing panos, they would um, violently suppress those operations. They would um, maintain the privilege for themselves to produce panos, and then they would use panos, again, this, this imbalance of value, to go and acquire um, their trading partners' goods and services in the marketplace. And one really insidious thing about this is that a lot of the panos itself was actually being constructed by expert African weavers. So as the Portuguese impose this monopoly, they would actually start to use the same kind of dynamic that played out with agribeads. They would start to impose um, the, the purchase basically of African slaves using panos. And then they would put these slaves to work in the production facilities, using them to weave the very money that they were robbing their countrymen with. So it's another, um, another highlighting of this dynamic in, in which those that can monopolize the production of money can use it as an apparatus of enslavement because they can directly steal time, goods, resources from others, uh, essentially in perpetuity, so long as they can maintain and preserve that monopoly through violence, coercion, deception, etc. Um, so this, you know, I argue that these histories of human action related to agribees and related to Panos, that they hold very important lessons for a modern era that's dominated by um, money monopolies, which we call central banks. And the lesson is that those who can monopolize the production of money become de facto currency counterfeiters and they can steal labor in perpetuity. Again, so long as they can preserve that monopoly. And, um, you know, said differently, this is m money monopolists are able to steal human time, right? You can print the very uh, token that people accept in exchange for their time. And, and the time could be uh, embodied in a, a good or service or even knowledge that that person spends time generating and curating something of value to other people. So this ability to monopolize money effectively makes the operation a currency counterfeiting operation because they're creating money that's not subjected to free market forces, which effectively makes that operation a slave master. So they're actually acquiring um, human time at an unfair price, or said differently, they're stealing human time. And so one of the lines in the piece is, I say, an exclusive right to produce money with, without, without regard to competitive market pressures is an apparatus of enslavement, a vile privilege that monopolists can only preserve through deception and violence. And... Um, yeah, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, this, these two episodes sort of define a lot of the history of violence of humanity. Like, we, we've uh, learned in history class about all the different wars and things that have, that have played out over the years and the different reasoning behind them. But if you really trace it all the way down... Um, to its original source, you know, these are most often battles and skirmishes over territory, resources, um, or sometimes ideological collision. But there's, you know, war is a very expensive activity. It's among the most expensive activities humans can engage in. And people being mostly rational economic actors, you're only going to engage in war if there's something economic to be gained. So 
a lot of this has been people fighting over the money. And this is why, because money being the most liquid and acceptable asset in trade in the marketplace is the ultimate token of power in the world. So people have fought continuously over generations to try and control money. Um, and again, that's why gold was ultimately chosen because it was the asset most resistant to supply manipulations. So no matter who tried to manipulate its supply, it was the most resistant to them. However, gold suffered because it is of its physicality. Um, it could be well, two things. One, it's heavy, right, to transact. So it's much easier and more economic to transact in paper backed by gold than gold itself, which led to its centralization and bank vaults. And two, because of gold's physicality, it can be forcibly confiscated. So, for instance, every time Nazi Germany invaded a country in World War II, they, their first stop was the central bank. They went straight to hoard the gold reserves. Um, and this is sort of a, a foreshadowing to the importance of Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is the first money in history whose supply is absolutely beyond manipulation. There will only ever be 21 million units. No one can change that. And two, because it's, it's non-corporeal, so it's not tangible. It cannot be physically and forcibly stolen from someone. Someone has to voluntarily articulate uh, their private keys to, to give someone uh, their Bitcoin. And what this says to me, um, which I, I've self-identified, I, I don't necessarily like to put uh, a political term to myself or others. However, it is important to get our language precise. So I've, I've tried to capture my beliefs and perspectives in a quote, um, in, a, in a moniker that I refer to myself as a freedom maximalist. And what this means to me is that a number of things. First, on a purely economic basis, human beings create wealth through trade, right? This is economics 101. If you make hats faster than I make shoes and we both specialize in trade, we have created more aggregate wealth by focusing on our specialties and trading with one another than we could on our own, right? So human beings are designed to collaborate, right? Like Marcus Aurelius said, we're like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. We're like the left and the right hands. We're meant to work together. Um, and so that's first. Free trade is how we create wealth, right? Wealth is what reduces the tensions to conflict in the world. The more wealth there is, the less conflict is necessary because everyone's needs, more people's needs are met, right? Um, and in that perspective, I also think that anything that has to be decreed, right, by government fiat or um, a, a law that has to be enforced, these are largely um, things that do not contribute to the well-being of humanity, right? Like there's a very basic... Basic tenets of morality are kind of like, you know, don't kill, don't steal, which we could expand to maybe, you know, no violence, no theft. Anything beyond that um, really gets into a, a complicated domain where you're, you're trying to in, in, legislate morality or, or enforce a morality on people that, that they maybe don't have. So I think by optimizing for free choice and free trade in systems of human organization, that's how we create the best outcomes. It's how we generate the most wealth, right? Which is, again, inversely proportionate to conflict. The more wealth we have, the less conflict we should have under a normal free trade system. Um, and two, it leads to the greatest satisfaction in life because not only are people as wealthy as possible, but they are free to create the types of societies that they see fit for themselves, right? Um, communities can fork off and assemble themselves based on whatever their beliefs are. And, uh, you know, with this kind of libertarian attitude of do whatever you want, as long as you don't tread on me, um, I think the world is, is, is best organized. So 
a lot captured in that quote, you know, to be moral and act must be free. So you have to ask yourself, anything you're doing that you don't want to do, is it moral, right? Is it, it, why are you doing it? Who's imposing that action on you? And is that true, right? If you're doing something you don't want to do, you're not living in truth for yourself. So are you creating positive consequences in the world by doing something that's unfree? Um, I think if you really think about it and look into it, it's hard to, to find a case where that's true. So I start this section talking about market competition. And market competition often viewed as kind of a Darwinian thing, right? Like companies competing in the free market, trying to make as much profit as possible, being as cutthroat as necessary. But what's, I think it's more accurately described as a process of discovery. So, and the example I use is sports. So in sports, the reason two teams meet in a certain place at a certain time, play a certain game according to certain rules, is to discover what team is best on any given day, right? In any given day of play. And entire seasons of sport are played to determine what team is best across an entire season of play. Because it's clearly some teams are going to have good days, some teams are going to have bad days. But averaged across an entire season, uh, you get a much more accurate portrayal of that, you know, team's coaching ability, the team's athletic capacity, uh, the cohesion of the team, all these factors uh, really come, are discovered, right? They come to the surface throughout this entire season of play. And you can compare this to market competition with business, where entrepreneurs are essentially competing to satisfy customer wants. Uh, and these can be unarticulated wants. These can be things that customers didn't even know they wanted, right? I mean, how many of us knew 30 years ago that we all wanted on time Amazon Prime delivery to our doorstep 24-7, right? I don't think anyone necessarily articulated that, but Bezos, as an entrepreneur, was able to go out into the marketplace um, and discover and satisfy this customer want, and in doing so, make himself and his shareholders very wealthy. So this game of market competition is that. It is the process of entrepreneurs placing bets which are investments of time, capital, and energy, competing to satisfy customer wants as quickly, uh, as high quality, and as cheaply as possible. And it's through this process that we discover new and better ways of doing and making things, right? That is what innovation is. So another way to look at, at market competition as a process of discovery it is it is through that process that we discover new things, right? It is um, by Steve Jobs competing with the legacy information ecosystem is how he essentially discovered um, the iPhone, right? Or the iPod, like these new ways of satisfying customer wants are discovered as a result of these collisions between entrepreneurs in the marketplace. Um, and this is really, it marks, the market competition is the catalyst for honest work and progress at a civilizational level, right? Everything that we benefit from, like this camera that I'm looking into, this laptop that I have in front of me, this mic, all of these, these ideas that are instantiated in matter are created because we have had an entire history of entrepreneurial competition of people trying to solve problems, um, and this is, the, this is the discovery process. So in a very real way, and the American pragmatist put this best, they defined truth as the end of inquiry. So we can conceive as free, of free markets as these open forums for free exchange, right? Um, where entrepreneurs are constantly making inquiries of themselves, their skill sets, their team, their organization, their, uh, their good or their service, their customers' demand, constantly making these inquiries into the nature of reality um, and relationships to determine 
if there's a better way to satisfy a customer want, right? And that's what they're constantly betting on. They're going to bet on this approach versus that approach. And that's what market competition is. So markets can be thought of as these forums that basically generate truth, right? These constant um, domains, these domains of constant inquiry that are zeroing in on mankind's best approximation of truth at any given time, constantly and continuously. And pragmatically, truth, again, as the end of inquiry, it's generated in three forms in markets. And it comes in the form of accurate prices, useful tools, and individual virtue or competitive competence, depending on how you want to look at it. So again, pragmatically, truth is kind of that which is, um, which is most useful, you could think, right? So a, if you think of a market as um, the, this, this layered sphere of trading happening all the time, and everything in that layered sphere, this, you know, a flurry of goods and services flying around the world all the time, trades between two people, companies, parties, all, everywhere. Everything trades at a ratio of everything else, right? A house might be worth 15 cars or, or this hot tub might be worth, um, you know, two dozen dishwashers, something like that. These ratios are constantly changing, right? But at the very outermost layer of that sphere, if you consider it, um, the more often something is traded, the higher it is and uh, the more external it is to the sphere, is by definition money, right? Money is simply the most tradable asset in an economy. So all of these trade ratios between different goods and services ultimately become denominated in money because money is the thing everyone wants to trade for so they can trade to whatever else they want, right? So you're, you're not going to go and try and trade your car for, for a number of hot tubs, right? You would just as soon sell your car and buy the hot tub. And that's because money is the, the, the one asset, the medium of exchange that is most liquid or most tradable. So in that sense, prices, as we commonly think of them, right? This car costs $40,000, is just an exchange ratio denominated in money for simplicity's sake, right? So we can, we can speak in this common language of numeracy that we call money, versus trying to calculate how many hot tubs this car is worth, or et cetera, et cetera. So markets generate this truth constantly. They generate accurate prices. And that is one of the key features of markets. That's how people know how to orient and organize themselves in the world, right? If there's an earthquake in Chile and there's a disruption to um, lithium, right, for batteries or whatever, I don't know if they have lithium in Chile, frankly, but then suddenly the supply of lithium would contract, the price of it would increase because the prices were supply and demand meet, and all of a sudden everyone in the world that interacts with lithium knows they either need to reduce their consumption of it on, on the consumption side of the market or on the production side, they have an incentive to sell more of it because it's moving at a higher price. So this is how economic systems resolve themselves and heal themselves is through this price signal. So it's kind of like an economic nerve signal. And the second form of truth that markets generate are useful tools, right? So again, we're back to this uh, entrepreneurs betting with one another in the marketplace, trying to solve customer wants, and in that process, gleaning new knowledge, which comes to us in the form of innovations. Um, so we could say quite literally that any tool that's successful in the marketplace is an embodiment of truth, right? So when we have a, a shovel, for instance, like a shovel is crafted in a very specific way, right? As the shaft has a certain length, the handle's shaped a certain way, the head has a certain uh, pointedness to it, the bolts are, are screwed in a certain way, there's a, a little ledge to, to press your foot and dig the hole. All of these nuances to that tool have been discovered through market competition over time as the best way to satisfy the human want to dig holes, right? We've tried to figure out what is the quickest and best way for me to dig this hole. And the culmination of all these learnings across history is that very specific shovel design. 
Now, of course, there's going to be different shovels at different price points, um, but the general design structure we could say, the knowledge structure on which that tool is constructed, any of those tools that are successful in the marketplace at any given price point is a form of truth, right? It is an in, the end of inquiry, right? We've been inquiring how best to satisfy this customer want to dig holes, and this is what we've got, the shovel, right? So markets generate prices, they generate tools, and then finally, uh, they instill individual entrepreneurs with virtue um, and competitive competence, uh, which I, I think are kind of one and the same, actually, in that when you're an entrepreneur operating in a free market, you are governed by the preferences of your customers, right? If you don't satisfy those customer wants, which is the ultimate aim of, of market competition, then they're going to leave you for your competitors, right? Your profits will decline. You will go out of business. You will be naturally selected uh, unfavorably against, right? In kind of a Darwinian sense. So you have a constant financial incentive to be accountable to your customers, to serve your fellow man um, in a in a you know proper economic uh, and thoughtful way. And should you deviate from that path, um, you're you're a goner, right? So in that sense, I, I kind of consider individual virtue a product of free markets as well. And um, we'll go into a, we'll dig into a a bit more of this shortly in, in how markets actually influence morality, but in a very general sense that we can actually consider free markets as these systems of truth generation, right? They're generating accurate prices, useful tools, and individual virtue. And the points in these market-based games of discovery, of course, are denominated in money, right? Again, the most tradable thing is how we account for uh, a, a history of sacrifices and successes along this entire history of economic transactions. Um, again, back to Bezos, right? Why is he the richest man in the world? And he has satisfied customer wants at a scale never before seen, right? Um, so he, he, I think, would be in, in many ways an epitome of a, a successful entrepreneur. And in this, in a free market system, um, when it is, its mechanisms are manipulated or suppressed, again, um, the opposite of a free market would be a monopolist, right? Someone that uses deception, violence, and legal coercion to prevent market competition. So to prevent this process of discovery such that they can keep all the spoils for themselves. That would be the polar opposite of a free market as a monopoly. And the gradations between free market and monopoly are what are commonly called regulations or laws, right? So these are all impediments. Uh, anything, any impediment beyond kind of basic morality, again, don't kill, no violence, no stealing. Uh, all of the regulations are basically a stepping stone uh, along the path away from a free market towards a monopoly. And when you get into a fully monopolized market, you have actually totally perverted this truth-finding function of free markets in that you get inaccurate prices. Uh, a great example would be today, this is in the US in 2020, we have stock market breaking all-time highs post-COVID, but we have 40 million plus people unemployed, right? Price signals are broken. The uh, prices of equities and the markets do not reflect their underlying reality. Um, and to see this a little more clearly, you can actually look at the valuation metrics, right? I think Zoom, for instance, was trading at a PE ratio of 1800x. Um, totally gone, right? This totally it makes no sense. Doesn't make any economic sense whatsoever. But because central banks have monopolized the market for money, they've heavily distorted the price signal. So that's one form of truth that's broken as we go from truthful price signals to inaccurate price signals. Secondly, the tools and innovation that we use actually become inferior, right? This incentive to satisfy customers by achieving the highest end of inquiry, right? By figuring out the best way to serve customers is subverted 
by the incentive to get as close to the money monopolist, as close to the fiat currency spigot as possible. So uh, innovation suffers, right? And you can see this very clearly if you look at industries closer to the state. So if you look at education, uh, clearly government, anything government related is terribly uh, uninnovative. Just ask your local DMV. Um, or even healthcare, right? It's, been, it's become much more rife with bureaucracy versus uh, healthcare providers ever since we went onto a fiat currency standard in 1971. So in this sense, whereas free markets generate truth in the form of uh, accurate prices, useful tools, and individual virtue, unfree markets or monopolies do the opposite, right? They create inaccurate price signals, uh, inferior tools, and they actually incentivize individual and moral wickedness. Um, because a monopolist is not subject to the preferences of their customers. They don't give a shit what the customer thinks because the customer has no other choice. They have to use their product at whatever price the monopolist says. And it's in that sense, um, not only does it is it an institution of deceit, but it's also kind of an institution of evil as well, which, which we'll see as we get into central banking a little more. And specifically for money producers, you know, monopolization, once again, it makes these dishonest producers uh, de facto currency counterfeiters. So it gives them a deceptive and violent dominion over human time. You can print a good that no one else can create that is redeemable for human time in the marketplace. So it is, again, time theft. Essentially, it's a, we can look at central banking as an institutionalized system of time theft. Contrary to conventional wisdom, a lot of people say that money is the root of all evil or the love of money is the root of all evil. Um, but what again, what it actually is, is just this tool for trading human time, right? It's just the most tradable thing in, in a market, which markets in general are the, the forum through which human beings collaborate economically, right? It's how we take advantage of the comparative advantage, which is kind of the, the, the kernel of economics, if you will. And so to say that money itself is immoral, right, to say it's the root of all evil, doesn't make a lot of sense because a tool itself, any tool, is amoral, meaning that it has no independent morality of its own. Every tool's moral consequences would be inexorably dependent on the user. So with what intention is the user wielding that tool, right? Is it for good intentions or bad intentions? And the example I give is that, you know, money's a temporal trading tool, so it can be used to facilitate those trades, or it can be perverted, like by central banks, to steal time instead. In the same way that a hammer could be used to build a house, right, which would clearly satisfy a want and take care of people and be a good moral thing, or that hammer could be used to bash a skull, right, it could be used to kill someone, which would be uh, an evil act or something that is not good for humanity. So again, the, the utility, the moral utility of a tool is dependent on the morality and moral intentions of its user. And so what I, I like to say instead is that in money is more like the root of all sovereignty. Not necessarily the root. Money is more of the highest expression of our sovereignty. So sovereignty is a interesting word. Um, it essentially means the authority to act as one sees fit in the world. And it's a word etymologically associated with monarchy, with money, and royalty. Um, but what it, it really refers to is this, this locus of supreme power in the sphere of human action. So according to natural law, which basically says that... Um, According to natural law, sovereignty inheres within the individual. So we're not given rights from a, a top-down institution like government, but we're actually born with these natural rights to, to life, to liberty, and to property. Um, and that government is one of those institutions that we voluntarily create to help facilitate the functioning of the free market. Um, 
And in that sense, we are, we must always choose whatever actions we will individually take, no matter what the external world says. Right. So the, the, the principle here is it's commonly referred to as reason or uh, the ancients called this the logos, which is basically referring to this inviolable principle of reason, this final human freedom that we all have, that we can always choose our interpretation of our circumstances or, um, or our observations in the world, right? No one can impose a belief upon us. We can all voluntarily in all situations, uh, accept or discard beliefs, right? We can, we can tell and believe stories, right? Um, stories like money, like, uh, the nation state, like human rights. These are all symbolic yet useful fictions that actually separate man from animal, right? The reason that we can have 10,000 men on a battlefield united under a flag, Whereas a primate troop can have no more than 150 because they can't formulate these abstractions. They can't orient themselves to these abstractions um, or throw themselves behind a cause at scale is the reason mankind dominates the world, right? It's the reason we're able to organize ourselves at scale because we're able to use uh, these useful abstractions. And all of this is rooted in our in the logos, right? So the generative source of sovereignty is the logos. It's our ability to um, understand, generate, and interpret these, these symbolic abstractions. And from this word sovereignty, we get the word reign. Um, and if we look at kind of the reign of, of human organizations throughout history, we can see that social institutions have been naturally decentralizing over time. So in the Grand Arc, we would look at, say, ancient Egypt, where you had the pharaohs who were sovereign, everyone else was a slave, right? Um, maybe halfway along that curve, we have more traditional monarchies, right? Where there's uh, many regional monarchies with a, a few sovereigns at the top, a uh, small semi-sovereign aristocracy, and a lot of serfs or slaves kind of working the land and serving those at the top all the way to uh, modern day Western democracies where in, in theory at least, uh, all of us are sovereign. All of us are able to vote and participate in the political process uh, to determine the movement of the entire social organism. Um, and so it, what, what's been happening is this gradual decentraliz decentralization of sovereignty away from uh, pure tyranny, right, say in ancient Egypt, to something that more closely mirrors natural law today. And at the foundation of Western civilization and English common law uh, is that precept, actually, that the sovereignty of the individual is held to be higher than the sovereignty of the state. So we, no matter what someone has done, we acknowledge that the value of that human being is superordinate to any, any particular act they may have engaged in, right? So this is embodied in legal uh, constructs like innocent until proven guilty, uh, habeas corpus here in the US, and, and also freedom of speech rights, right? That is the First Amendment in the, the US Constitution. And beneath that is essentially the, the foundation for a peaceful society. Because if you are unable to voice uh, your concerns or dissent and let your ideas go to battle, so to speak, to actually go and collide and conflict with others uh, to release, release this pressure and tension between people, this animosity between people in the ideological sphere, then you will be forced uh, ultimately to go to physical or kinetic battle with them at some point. So if we can't let our words and ideas go to battle and die for us, then our bodies will be forced to. So that's kind of this, which is maybe the greatest idea humanity ever had, is that we have to honor the freedom of speech above all other concepts uh, in civilization to maintain social cohesion across time. 
Uh, and that is all, uh, again, the most closely mirroring structure of natural law we've ever had, right? It's, it's, it's honoring and respecting the logos in each individual. Um, and going into speech a little bit more deeply, kind of looking at it from an evolutionary development standpoint, speech actually arose in humans as a direct result of our evolutionary development. So when we began walking upright, all of a sudden, we didn't need our hands for locomotion anymore. Like you may have seen a primate move around, you know, they're typically on all fours. Sometimes they're bipedal, but usually kind of using their hands um, actively for locomotion. When human beings started to stand upright, a couple of things happened. One, our hands are freed up, right? So we don't need them for locomotion anymore. We started to develop opposable thumbs, which gave us a... a a miraculous new and unique ability to particularize the world, to sort and count and point. Um, pointing was very important because as we stood up, our visual field in the world was drastically expanded. So we, with and along with this kind of fine um, dexterity and ability to particularize the world, co-evolved fine musculature in the face and tongue. So as we're able to, to particularize the world in more and uh, varied and unique forms, we actually started to develop speech alongside that um, as a means of, I guess, vocalizing and specifying uh, the different creations and tools and um, substances we were, we were interacting with. And all of this led to people becoming much more collaborative, right? Because... It led to tool making, right? More sophisticated tool making with more with finer dexterity and this power of speech. Speech clearly led to thinking, right? Thinking even today we have an internal dialogue that's based in speech. Um, so it's gradually enabling us to be more interactive with our environment in a more sophisticated manner, which allowed people to collaborate more successfully across time, right? Which so that's what led to trade, right? Better tools, more trade more interaction through speech. Um, and at the, at the apex of trade, again, is the most tradable thing. The most tradable thing in any society is money, quite simply. So we had dexterity sort of co-evolve with speech, um, which led to trade, trade led to money. So in that sense, Money can be thought of as a form of speech in and unto itself, right? It's a way that, it's a mode of sovereign expression we have with others that we maybe can't see, um, but we are communicating with, right? Through the price signal, right? What do we value collectively? That's what the price is. Um, and some people have actually called money the language of value. And I make the argument that placing limitations on that language of value is as commensurately catastrophic as placing restrictions on the freedom of speech, which, as the 20th century showed us, is a slippery slope toward totalitarianism. Every aspiring dictator, now this happened in Nazi Germany, this happened in Soviet Russia, their first maneuver is to try and silence the voice of dissent. Because the, the greatest threat to the state is sound intellectual criticism, right? If someone, again, is, is attacking them in the ideological sphere, they can attack the, the power base that supports the belief in that institution. And that is, the, that is what threatens the state more than anything. So the first thing, uh, again, a tyrant or dictator wants to do is silence that voice. They want to suppress the logos to protect uh, their immediate short-term interests. So logos is a Greek word that means actually ratio or word. And it's... That principle, again, is at the core of interpersonal communications among people, right? Um, which are mostly conducted in words, right? We typically think we communicate predominantly in words. Um, however, again, logos means word or ratio. It is also contained in prices, which, again, are exchange ratios denominated in money, right? So whereas words would be our mode of uh, comparative analysis in the ideological sphere, 
Prices are our mode of comparative analysis in the kinetic sphere, right? What do we actually want? What have we actually done? What are, the, what are we actually trading, buying, selling? That's what prices capture. And both of these categorical comparatives are expressions of the logos we use to interoperate as people, right? It is how we collaborate as human beings. And again, that, that, and that, that's interesting too because it, it zeroes in on the power of the logos to render order from chaos, right? We're born into this natural world of unexplored territory, trying to figure out how to make our way, not only today, but into the future. And we, we do that by trading, right? Through, through speaking with one another, through communication, through, which is how we construct things, right? So the logos, again, is, almost, is used as a system to take the natural world, which is not well understood, uh, not conceived of at all, right? Until we sort of pass it through our interpretive filter, called the logos, again, our ability to, to tell and believe stories to symbolically, excuse me, represent things. And we, we start to label things and that makes them real in a new, at a new level, right? This, they're not only physically real at that point, but now they've become ideologically real. And once they're in the ideological sphere, we can do all sorts of crazy things with them, right? But, um, that's what math is, right? Math isn't real in the sense that the number two is going to float by, but math is almost hyper real in the sense that it can be used to map territory um, and map reality in such a fine, particularized fashion that it gives us our, our greatest grip on, on the world, right? And it's what's led to so many modern innovations today. It was a firm grasp of mathematics. Um, so in that sense, we can consider the market price as kind of it's a, in a free market as its own form of free speech. And in the market for money today, that's monopolized by central banks, they totally distort the price of money, which in turn, because all trades are denominated in money, all prices are denominated in money, distorts the prices of everything else. And monopolists do this by compelling the demand for money. So it's required under threat of violence, coercion, death, that you spend this money to settle debts or to pay taxes or to buy oil so they're, they're, they're artificially imposing demand value on the money while simultaneously violating the supply through inflation to benefit themselves. So what we have is a logos manipulation in the marketplace by central banks such that they are, are, are forcing demand for this money down people's throat while they simultaneously confiscate its supply to benefit themselves. So this is, and this is why I like to draw the comparison between words and prices is because these are our quintessential modes of comparative expression and communication. And we know that violating words, right? Speech is really bad for humanity, right? That's how we got Nazi Germany. That's how we got Soviet Russia. Um, and I argue very loudly and clearly that violating prices is equally catastrophic, right? We're, we're, again, we're manipulating the logos, the collective logos, um, to the detriment of many for the benefit of the few. And this is a, a path that does not lead anywhere good for people. Um, and I think we're seeing that sort of loud and clear in the world today. 50 years into this fiat currency experiment um, with, you know, the world coming apart at the seams in a lot of ways. For over 5,000 years, precious metals were favored as money. So for over 5,000 years, precious metals have been the most favored monetary technology in the world. And that is because they best satisfied the five properties of good money, which are divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, and scarcity. 
Scarcity is arguably the most important property because what it gives a money is assurance of supply limitation. So this is can be thought of as a restriction on the greedy impulse of humanity. Whereas if a money is not resistant to supply increase, that inevitably the greediest person will go out and increase its supply, right? They will produce more of whatever the money is to sell it into the market and basically steal the value sort in other people's market for themselves. So again, that's why gold was chosen. Gold was the asset with a supply most resistant to inflation across history. Um, and governments, again, throughout history, they've always interceded in the market for money. Um, largely, we would associate this with coinage, right? Where one of the problems with monetary metals is that to transact in them, each transaction, you have to assay the value of the metal. So you actually have to weigh it. You have to determine um, if it's uh, high quality, if it's authentic, right? You may remember people kind of biting a gold coin. That was to see if they could get their teeth marks into it to make sure it was soft gold. Um, you have to verify the authenticity of the metal and weigh it, its purity and all these things. So there's a cost to that on a transaction by transaction basis that makes the, the monetary tech, or that makes metal as a monetary tech less useful, right? Because all of a sudden you're incurring this transaction cost every time you have to trade in money. So what happens is that governments basically, well, first of all, it started out as a private function, like all things do, it's a free market enterprise. The certification function businesses became a thing in, in the market for coins. So they would take a coin, certify its weight, right? Put a stamp on it that was basically the reputation of the coin certifier. And then that coin could be transacted without the need to assay it at each transaction. You didn't need to verify the, the weight, purity, and authenticity of the coin at each transaction because you could instead just trust the stamp, which was basically a representation of the reputation of the coin certifier. So this business, this coin certification process inevitably became monopolized by the state, right? They just, uh, you know, the, the smug emperor just decided it's better to put his face on there and own the trust function um, than, the, than the individual certification businesses. And what this did was it basically shifted the need to trust uh, the, the techniques of verifying the, the purity, the weight, the authenticity of the metal, again, the saying the metal, to the certification business. But then when the state monopolized that, it, it basically shifts the need to trust the state. And um, the state has always sought to monopolize money because it gives them the ability to violate that trust function at will, to compromise um, you know, what money is, is the trust network, right, in a society. It's like the reason you go and uh, accept, you don't, you don't accept your merchant's IOU, right? You want money from that merchant. So you don't have to trust him. You want to reduce your counterparty risk in any given transaction. Um, so governments basically step in to fill the trust function for the trust network that is money but then inevitably they give in to violating that trust to their own interests, right? That's what, that's the, that is the history of money in a nutshell, basically. And, um, you know, eventually, as we, as we described earlier, gold came to be denominated in paper warehouse receipts. So again, because of the physicality of gold, it made more economic sense to put it in a warehouse, issue paper certificates that could be redeemed for gold. Uh, people would then transact in that paper that was as good as gold, um, but could be redeemed for real gold at any time. So this is actually resolving uh, the portability, divisibility, and recognizability functions of gold. So, and that's what the US dollar was, right? The US dollar was a paper warehouse receipt redeemable for gold until that redeemability was revoked by the federal government. And um, this just 
harkens back to any time you insulate an institution from competitive market pressures, right? As markets are these uh, processes of discovery, that trust in that monopolist is inevitably going to be shattered. They have no incentive to continue to be trustworthy. So they're not. No monopolist throughout history, this is Economics 101, is ever um, ever trustworthy, right? They always violate the trust place in them. So it's 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 amazing to me that we this is not more well known. The fact that central banking is tolerated in this you know quote unquote enlightened age, um, I think really just shows how far we have to go as a species. Um, so when we say a central bank is printing money. It's important to know that the only real money a central bank has is gold. The dollars that they produce were just redemption or warehouse receipts for that gold at one point that they then eliminated the redemption option for. So what they are now are basically uncollateralized debt certificates undergoing slow motion default as they are forced on the population, forced to be used by the population. And in that sense, when we say printing money, they're actually just counterfeiting currency, right? So now we're back to the Agribeads and the Panos monopolist uh, and how they counterfeited currency and the implications that it had for the people that they forced it upon. Um, you know, again, money is just this tool for trading time, but to counterfeit a currency, which is just something that should be redeemable for real money, right? Like paper redeemable for gold is only useful for one thing as a tool. And that is inflicting wealth inequality, right? If I am producing, I have 10,000 ounces of gold and I have $10,000 redeemable for one ounce each, if I expand that supply of paper such that it exceeds what I have available for redemption, that expansion is a lie, right? It is, it is counterfeit. It is not real money. And you're essentially inflicting wealth inequality on whoever is forced to use that paper such that you reallocate wealth from the, the users of currency to the holders of money or the whole, the people that can produce the money, which is the central bank. So no matter which way you put it, counterfeiting currency is useful only for inflicting wealth inequality. And that's a very important point. Um, especially in a day and age where people think they seem to be operating under the illusion that printing money is somehow good for, um, for society in some way. And it's just not the case. So, of course, when, when circumstances become too uncertain, market participants naturally flock back to the trust minimization of gold, right? When a currency finally does start to collapse in hyperinflation, people want to use a currency that's not hyperinflating, right? A lot of times in emerging economies, we see people going to the dollar because the dollar is yet to hyperinflate because it is the world reserve currency. Um, but gold is also favored in those situations. And... It's because gold is what the free market selected as money, right? It is what best satisfied the five properties of money, the visibility, durability, recognizability, portability, and of the monetary metals that satisfied those properties, it was the most scarce. So in that sense, gold is an expression of the collective logos um, and the, the self-declared sovereign state that's built on top of that is only called sovereign because it's built a business of confiscating these self-sovereign monies, right? Any tool, right, gold included, that has been accepted and promoted by the free market as the most useful tool for its relevant function is an expression of the collective logos, right? So gold is an expression of the collective logos, and it has imbued into it the sovereignty of those who have voluntarily adopted it as money across time. And when a state 
calls itself sovereign, the state only has the authority to act and pass these laws because it built its business confiscating these self-sovereign monies. So that's what the state is. The state is the biggest gang in all the land that holds the most money, and they call themselves sovereign. So it's it's a direct contradiction to natural law. Um, and, you know, I just don't think that this type of monopolized business model is going to persist into the digital age.